dokey. Sound. Sounds like it's okay. Hello, Ujwal Shrestha. I'm sorry if I absolutely mangle everybody's name. I'll try my absolute best. <laughs> um, Alright, Open Insulin on Twitch is coming along fine. And then... Um, open Insulin on Biofoundry page. Okie dokie. Good. So lining up to start in about 30 minutes. Like, unlike. How do I make installation at home? <laughs> Hello, meow. Good morning. I would recommend that if you do are making installation at home that you do not use. Oh no. What's the name? What's the name of the stuff that gives you uh, all of the cancer? Hmm. All right. Can I view this as me? There we go. Share as me. Start a watch party. Start. There we go. Start. There we go. <sighs> All right. So mm -hmm. that's happening. Oh, God. There's going to have to be so many muted things here. Okay. Mm. Now let's see how the mob crush chat asbestos. That's the one. Asbestos. Asbestosis. That's the one that ends in an osis is the cancer that you get in the lungs. All right. I think I think we're we're about as shared as we can get. Maybe one more on my own timeline as well. All right, how's the chat here? Nice to meet you here. And hello, I'm going to try this again. Hirendi Raj Joshi. Hello. So for anyone else tuning in on different platforms, the main questions I'm going to be responding to are here on Unhangout Media Lab. And we're starting in about 13 minutes. So can I also share this as me? There you go. Wonderful. Uh, I might have to turn down the sound of the call outs as well, because that might start to get a bit spammy and annoying. Can we... Let's see here. Chat box, alert box, and supporter bar. We'll just turn you down a little bit. And you can also turn off phone. I think it was the sound of it dying anyway. Okay, good. Hello, hello. Sorry about the streamception there. We'll come back here to make insulin at home. Up to now only four. Yep, looks like we've got four people there, but we've also we're also live on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook, so there might be other people asking questions elsewhere. And we've still got half an hour until we start. Or sorry, twelve minutes until we start. Hmm. Got a presentation here and we've also we'll try and leave it open for questions. Let's see if I can reorganize my screen to better display these comments. Hmm. Can't pop that out. May just have to put this into a separate window and alt tab between. It shouldn't be too challenging. Okay. Excellent. Twitch is functioning, Facebook is functioning, Bioacquisitive represent, hello. Yeah, so f second chat here, I'll put this one also. Put, try and put mob crush 
into this one. There we go. All right. Excellent. <clears throat> now every... Oh, okay. And that's still quite loud, isn't it? The sound of subscribers. Thank you very much for following, though. Um, event sounds. Okay, can we... Change the volume of them? No, perhaps we'll just have to mute them for the time being. Or I'll save, I'll save them, and if they start to get annoying, I'll... I can know how to switch it off now. <coughs> and whenever I have to go get a drink, I have to actually leave the lab, because it's a PC1 space. So... Uh, expect me to be a little bit back and forth. It's also in the middle of summer right now here in Australia, so... And it's the weekend in this rather large shed of a building, so it's actually quite warm in here. So, if I do... No others to joining? Oh, we just got... We just got... Yeah, there we go. Lots more joining. So, we'll continue to wait. We'll wait another ten minutes. And I'll just go get myself a drink. So while we're waiting, if anyone in the MIT uh, unhangout, unhangout, wants to tell me about who they are, where they're from, and what their background is, what sort of degree you've got, what you want to do, uh, what you'd like to get out of this, because I really just want to try and make this for the benefit of you who are watching. I have a presentation to take up some time if we want to have something to focus on, but if this is just an unstructured Q&A, that's also fine. So quite happy either way. Now if I look at this, is this is the live broad, broadcast showing up for you fellas? Let's have a look here. Device or permission error? Hmm. This is a very creaky chair as well, we don't want that. Right, oh, the. Okay, that's a problem. That's an issue. Um, let's see if we can have another look at the Facebook. Sorry, at the YouTube link here then. Copy this into here. Action embed. Play for all. Ah, oh, there we go. Beautiful. Okay. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, Chili Memes. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, the Robot Cryptic. Thanks so much for tuning in. I am going to be starting the lecture in about five or six minutes' time, so please do stick around. Thanks for stopping by, though, Chili Memes. Now it's working wonderful. So as I was just saying before, um, just before we lead into this thing, if anyone here in the Un Hangout chat wanted to tell me about where you're from, where you grew up, what you're studying at the moment, what you're trying to do, what you want to get out of this lesson, how I can help you. Um, I am very happy for this to be unstructured content where I just do Q&A, but I've also got a presentation I can give if we don't have any main questions. So tell me about yourself so I know what, know what sort of level as well to talk about. Because I have all the files in this computer so we can go really deep into the genetics if you want to and about as deep into the proteomics as I'm able to talk about, because I'm not very skilled in that area. Hey, geez, booze. Thanks for tuning in. I believe... Uh, what is that photo, though? I believe that's Benj. Thank you so much. And I hope you get better soon, Benj. <laughs> so we also have... Yeah, this presentation here. So present here. Cool. <laughs> um, asbestos? No, the, the, the talk about asbestos was talking about uh, insulation, not insulin. It was meow trolling me. Hello, it's me, Horenda Joshi from Nepal. Hello, Horenda. 
Am I getting that even slightly right? Let me know if I need a longer vowel sound somewhere. So is this disconcerting, having this up here in the live stream? It probably is, isn't it? Oh, and we've also got the chat overlay. Hmm. Are you giving a lecture? Yeah, we're giving a lecture on multiple different platforms, silly memes. Uh, let's see if I can instead go full screen. Nope. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, let's not mess too much with the overlay. What I might just do is delete the comment overlay and that will get those off the screen for the time being. Mm. Text, subscriber, supporter bar, display capture. Chat box. Hide the chat box. Sorry chat box, I'll be uh, focusing on these fellows. Hello from Brisbane, Australia. There's some Alexception going on. Yeah, there'll be a little bit of that as I pop back and forth. So you're from Nepal, studying biotechnology and so enthusiastic to learn about making insulin at home. Okay, good. Um, can I please try and just set some uh, scope over the project here that I can definitely teach you how to make insulin at home. I'm not sure I can teach you how to purify insulin to a medical purity. And then that's definitely where the next step of the project needs to come from. Um, but that's definitely far from a solved problem. So this is not going to let you make a med medicinal product at home. It will be able to make you something which you can test and show the efficacy of and the, the binding of. Um, but the next stage of using something like an HPLC for purification is definitely a problem that's yet to be solved on a low budget. But we are talking about some cheap DIY HPLC ideas now that I've got some of the people with the right skill set into the lab, people like machinists and coders and engineers. And I'm going to go take one more sip of water and then we'll get started, I suppose. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. No more stuffing about, no more drinks of water, let's have a start. And hello Ujwal Shresna, Ujwal Shresna, welcome, thank you very much for tuning in. We'll start in about two minutes. If it's possible, we would also like to launch its market in Nepal and other developing countries that make it much cheaper for the people. My man, fantastic, that's what I like to hear. I would love to be able to set you up with all of the tools that you need to be able to do that. Um, all the tools that I can provide, I should say, because I am, of course, limited in my knowledge as well. So please understand that. We might just turn this, this screen sound down completely. Um, let's have a look here. 
Yes, Chili Memes, we should do our best to be able to upload the VOD as well. Let's get rid of Facebook chat, unless it's telling me something. Yo, dude, close the door. All right, we can close the door. You don't need to actually close the door unless you're actively making a GMO, however, which we will not be today. So, don't need to worry about that, but good tip. What'll be really funny is if I go out for a drink of water and leave my wallet in here, thus locking myself out of the lab completely. And then it will become a very, very boring stream very, very quickly. All right, thanks, Meow. What streaming software are you using? We're currently using Streamlabs OBS and with a combination of the app Mob Crush to be able to stream to multiple platforms simultaneously. Okie dokie, to the main chat. Ujwal, event is starting in a few seconds. Okay, good. So let's open it up to the floor first of all, looking at the Un Hangout chat first for any questions. Um, ask me anything about myself, about the project, about what we are trying to do, about what we want to achieve. Um, uh, I would also love to hear some specific things about Nepal. I've looked at a lot of the world's different markets, but I don't know Nepal all that well. I do know that, um, now this is where I have my geography is good, neighboring India has two good companies which are uh, situated to provide relatively cheap insulin. Those are Biocon and Walkup. And so, yeah, I, yeah look, I'm, 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 glad, I'm glad that I didn't completely forget where Nepal was on the map. That's... Uh, it's, it's like when I get, I get angry when people get, get Australia and Austria confused. Um, so in India, Biocon and Wokart are, are producing insulin at probably the lowest price in the world. Um, but there's, that does not mean that there isn't room for you guys to also try and get in the market. Have you guys launched this homemade insulin in the market? No, no, please, please understand that at the moment, the main aim of the Open Insulin Project is to try and model the existing top to bottom process for making insulin. We decided that we didn't want to become manufacturers in the market because it would lead to a uh, it, would, it would lead to an issue of, mo of mixed motivations because as soon as we try and become profit making entities in the market we lose any urge to try and bring additional generics into the market and if we start up a profit making enterprise our aim is going to be to try and make money not to try and bring the global price down and so as third party actors in the market instead we hope to try and introduce competition by encouraging generic manufacturers in local economies to get into the market themselves. So that might be you guys. Um, we, have a, we have a group here in Australia, a, a husband and wife combo, who are trying to use our technology to launch a company in Bangladesh. Um, and so that, this might be able to provide you with the kickstarting point to be able to do that. But keep in mind that we've only gotten so far. What we have is sort of um, plasmids expressing protein in E. coli bacteria. Uh, but we're still working on purification and for us that's also a funding issue so we need to be able to try and find a cheaper way to do things. Okay. Any other questions from Un Hangout? It's worth noting that we probably would be able to launch into the market based upon the existing intellectual property laws. It's just that the... Okay, this is, this is the main challenge for us. In order to get launched into most markets around the world, we would actually need to get biosimilar approval from the FDA or the EMA. If you in Nepal are just trying to sell to people in Nepal, then you will have to go through your own country's uh, approval process. But as soon as you try and get into the international market and provide to the big economies and that are like that really set the global price, you need to actually get this biosimilar approval from one of these two places. Now that's changed a little bit just recently because the World Health Organization has just announced that they too will be trying to accredit insulin. But we are yet to see any companies come through that process. I think it's around about March or April this year that, that occurs. Hello, change makers. Myself, Janish KC from the beautiful country of Nepal. Wonderful. My, my mum and dad went to Nepal. I think they went through Kathmandu and other parts and they had only compliments for the people and how beautiful the country is. So my, I really hope that one day I'm lucky enough to get to go there myself. And hello, hi, Mouch Terran. Uh, as I was saying to everyone else before, if you have any questions now before I start the little lecture thing, please feel free to ask them and I'll do my best to answer. Okay. It's, it's about 30 degrees in here right now. The air conditioning is not on in our building, so I'm starting to sweat. 
Ah, if we were in this market, would there be any patenting problems? Excellent question. So, we worked very hard throughout the design of our project to stay away from all patents. Part of that was because, for a lot of it, the actual good chunk of the technical work, it was done at the University of Sydney with some sponsorship from them, which of course meant that their legal team inevitably got involved. So, the one time that we, there was a bit of a question around whether or not we would be crossing over a patent, we ended up throwing out two months of work and redesigning to be something which is actually in between patents. So, for 90% of the things that I'll be talking about today, it's expired intellectual property. For the remaining 10%, specifically the, the design of the insulin, the Winsulin linker, um, that's actually original open source um, novel research by us. So that's available to everyone and you're welcome to try it. That said, the Winsulin is not a biosimilar, it's entirely new, and so you would have to go spend about $100 million on the approval process and clinical trials as opposed to 10 million US dollars on biosimilar clinical trials. So as long as you're doing things like we are, using the T7 expression system, which is expired IP, using the human insulin uh, gene, which is expired IP, uh, using his tag purification, which is expired IP, you won't have any problems. The issue with patenting in the insulin market is actually more around the way that biosimilars are brought in and the way that you can make a single change to a molecule and obtain an effective patent extension by doing so. That said, human insulin is the stuff that we all produce naturally in our bodies if, we're, if we don't have type 1 diabetes or some forms of type 2 diabetes. So it really, it's good, if it's good enough for the goose, it's good enough for the gander. If, if, if it works in a natural uh, state, then there is absolutely no reason why using it in a pump would not be the most effective method either. Um, that said, talking to diabetics and hearing anecdotal evidence from them, a lot of them will tell you that using a long-acting insulin in combination with a short-acting insulin gives you the best metabolic control. And uh, as the experts in the field of actually using these things, I trust them. Like my good friend Adam, who is in the chat, I can see. Hello, Uncle Bill. Thanks for tuning in. Uncle Bill is tuning in from Georgia, and it looks like he's on YouTube this time, which is thank you for subbing there, my friend. Really appreciate it. Hello, Adam. So we'll um, uh, try and leave it to our uh, friends in Nepal for asking the majority of the questions. So any more questions to ask before we start talking about stuff? Um, and, and yeah, I, I do want to try and use this time to set some uh, expectations and to understand that what we are able to produce right now is a raw cell slurry that contains insulin that we can detect. I am not up to the point where I can produce a nice pure vial of insulin. And to do that, would I, I, I can get closer by using a syringe, cotton wool, and his tag slurry, but I am not able to get to the full, beautiful, only human insulin, no E. coli uh, stage that you would require for a medicinal product. At the initial stage of making insulin at home to launch these products, I think there will be a problem of funding. Very, very good point. So I'm again going to say that the talk is not particularly well named, and that's probably a, pro a mistake of uh, communication between Sundarshan and myself. But the uh, I'll answer that question next. But the it's it's worth noting that I'm not really trying to make insulin at home. We did have a discussion early on in the project back when I joined the Americans around about 2017, 2018, where we talked about the concept. Oh, 2016, 2017. We we're talking about the concept of bathtub insulin, small scale DIY purification, which is probably what you're thinking of when you think of make insulin at home. This would be something that a single doctor would be able to use. They just put the bacteria in the top, provide bacteria food, and the entire system does the does the fermenting and the purification without you having to have any input and spits out a vial of purified insulin. The legal challenges of such a mission ended up sort of crushing that idea. So we are, I believe, mostly as a team, more interested in trying to encourage existing generic manufacturers that already have a very large amount of funding and are large companies, or smaller entrepreneurs in individual markets, such as you might be yourself in the Nepal market, to enter the market in our stead. Uh, we would we, we want to be able to, without any fear or favour for one party or the other, provide all the information open source to them to give them the best opportunity to, to succeed, but also to sketch out the risks and challenges that might occur. Next question from Hi Mouch Patel. Is it genetically engineered insulin? It sure is. Uh, we were having a discussion just recently about the loopholes between 
does plasma transfer as a sort of transient expression platform count as genetic engineering? And we would certainly say yes. Here in Australia, it's technically sort of in a legal grey zone where it's considered an exempt dealing. And so it isn't a legal GMO, even if it is a technical GMO. That said, as you'll see in the presentation, the two main E. coli expression systems that I brought back home from the University of Sydney, they are both plasmid expression systems. The third one, which ended up staying at the University of Sydney because the WB800 e uh, Bacillus subtilis strain was still under patent protection by the University of Sydney, that is an integrative plasmid. So that plasmid gets into the cell and then cuts the gene into the genome. And so that would absolutely, no gray zones whatsoever, be considered genetic engineering. Um, because that's no longer a transient expression that would be spat out if the antibiotic stopped being in the media. That would actually be a uh, full-on... Uh, it's still it's not constitutive expression. It's still under a promoter, but it is something which is now entirely held within the genome. How many... Uh, how many guys... How, sorry. How many years did you guys be involved until making cheap insulin is now cheaper and cheaper? Very good question. Um... So I suppose the question is, how long have we been involved? Sorry, how long have we been involved? Have we made a difference yet? Um, how long do we think we'll need to be involved to make a difference in the future? So right now, I think that we haven't made a huge difference. I've been involved for about four years, and I think the project's been running for about six years. And the insulin price around the world continues to grow, if not quite at the speed that it did last decade. That said. Um, I really felt that we were sort of treading water, looking and looking for generic manufacturers to take up our idea until I was lucky enough to get to go to Geneva uh, in November of last year. Uh, that was for the first Experts uh, Diabetes Summit, which was run by the World Health Organization and the Geneva Health Forum in a sort of combination. And I was very lucky enough to get to give a little talk there, which will be the one that I give to you guys very early in the morning. and. The main sort of premise that I ended with there, and which you'll see in the talk, is the idea that we should try and rethink the intellectual property laws around biosynthetics and bio... Um, uh, anything, any biosynthetic medicine, anything that's made inside bacteria as opposed to chemically synthesized. My idea that I was presenting there was that when someone submits a patent for a biotechnological product, we give you a 15-year temporary monopoly in exchange for you handing us the intellectual property. Unfortunately, when it comes to biologics, the simple genetic information and inventive step described in a patent doesn't really cover the full scope of complexity of a bacterial expression system. And as a result, we've had to compensate for that in the approval process by creating an entirely new biosimilar approval channel. This channel is basically only exists in the FDA and the EMA. And any new company wishing to create a biological medicine has to apply through them. And tech, um, there's only been about three or four successfully successful products through the biosimilar uh, approval process that have managed to make it through. All of them have been from the big three insulin producing companies. And so what you have here is an effective barrier to entry to the global market, not so much to individual markets, that really pushes us towards an oligopoly market situation. So you don't even really need to have collusion within the market for the prices to be going up this high. Now, what was very, very exciting, and um, I, I, as a side note, Dr. Roglick, the director of the World Health Organization, complimented my idea at the end of the day, which made me blush like you wouldn't believe. And so there might be future a future for that sort of more radical change to intellectual property law. But in the short term, they've actually done something which I think is going to be a massive step and maybe just what we need to be able to actually see change and for things to rapidly uh, return to what it would normally look like when a patent cliff occurs, which is when the patent expires, the price of a, of a medicinal product tends to drop 90% as generic manufacturers enter the market. We want to try and get to that patent cliff. And after this meeting, and I, I definitely can't claim any credit for this, but Dr. Roglick from the World Health Organization announced that they too would start doing biosimilar approval. And so that means that as a, as a not-for-profit, as like no longer a big government body, and someone who's really looking to try and get smaller scale generic manufacturers to the market, there will likely be more competition in the thing which is stopping competition, which is in the approval side of things. So I really have a great deal of hope that after they have their first forum sometime around March, April, that we will start to see more manufacturers coming into the market. But when, when I, uh, the thing that I believe will need to occur to make insulin cheaper and cheaper is for more and more companies to join. 
if this uh, if this is only the project and not getting this insulin in the market as products, people facing the financial problem. Um, hmm. Hi, Render. I, I, do you mind rephrasing that question for me? I'm afraid I don't quite understand. And I'll have a quick sip of water because it's really hot in here. Uh, so the let's just have a quick look at Mob Crush while we wait. I spent my whole honors project trying to get a gene into a bacterial genome. Honors thesis was a list of things that didn't work. Bless you, Andrea. That is absolutely science at its finest. Spending many, many, many iterations and never actually getting things to function. Um, but you can come and practice here. We've actually got some integrative plasma um, that we you might be able to use. Um, uh, as well as a whole bunch of insulin producing plasmids, which we're happy to share with anyone in Nepal who feels like they might have the entrepreneurial edge to try and create a product in their market. <sighs> now, if I was to get to the point where I then ha I'm now able to model a the full purification top to bottom process and get a medicinal pure product, that is when I might start considering trying to spin off a a, a business from this, but one that I'm not directly involved in, in or one that the uh, Open Insulin Project is not directly involved in. We've got a group here in Australia, which is called the CSIRO, which is our main government research body, and they have a bunch of protein expression labs. And so I've sort of been in casual talks with them for a long period of time about them trying to just find a keen bunch of entrepreneurs who want to try and enter the market and produce human insulin under the knowledge that I'm going to be over here as an actor trying to bring even more competitors into the market because if I was to join that company and try and make profit out of it, we would lose a large edge in trying to bring more companies into it because one small Australian company is not going to make the difference in the global market for the number of diabetics. <laughs> Jeanette. Negative results are just as important as positive results. We need to make this as open as possible. Save lots of wasted money and time and sanity. That's what I'm hoping the YouTube channel is going to be. It's going to be a cons comprehensive list of my failures. Especially around agarose gels, because I'm starting to build up a large, large folder of failed agarose gels. And if people can learn from my mistakes, then that's even better. Alright, one more question, if there is any. If Horenda has, say, uh, wants to try and uh, retype that question so I can understand and answer him properly, because I'm, I'm afraid I'm not quite getting it. Uh, and then we'll just jump into the presentation. Thanks, Jeanette. I hope you enjoy it. Nick Coleman said that he liked it and he's going to use it for teaching his iGEM team how to mix buffers next year, so... Or this year, actually. It's already 2020. <laughs> no transcoding of the stream in Twitch today, so he was forced to YouTube. Transcoding? What's that mean? What are you doing? Is it, is it, is, is it working? At least? Hmm... Seems to be working. All right. Good, good. Okay, one more check over here. We want to learn the whole process of, of making insulin at home and are interested to bring it to the Nepal market. Okay, wonderful. Well, I will do my best to explain to you how much I have learned over the last three to four years and what, uh, what steps are necessary next. And if it is something which you want to try and do, we can try and talk between uh, the exporters, uh, the export um, administrators in our country, which is sort of the Department of Agriculture, the OGTR, the Border Force, all these various government bodies, and whoever is uh, overseeing imports in Nepal, and see if I can send you dried plasmid sample uh, across to there. Uh, if you don't also have uh, the E. coli strains for expressing it, we it might be a bit harder because sending living organisms is more difficult. Um, because you will also need either DH5-alpha bacteria, or which probably both, DH5-alpha and BL21 E. coli for doing the ex full expression of these. 
Um, so what I'll be talking about today really only goes up to the point of expressing and then trying to detect the expressed insulin. It doesn't involve a comprehensive purification process because the most effective way to do that is with a, some kind of liquid chromatography. Um, I can show you a sort of way that we do it with syringes and cotton wool, which is the low budget way that our lab approaches this. But I really would not recommend doing that for something which is going to actually end up in a human being. Uh, because you're more likely to kill them from the immune response than you are to save their life with the insulin. So, yes, please understand that this is still very limited. Um, it's still not, not even um, proven in a clinical trial that our product will work once purified. It's only proven that it binds uh, in certain situations and causes certain metabolic changes. Okay, wonderful. Well, let's hop across to the presentation and I'll just do my best to talk about this. And I'll make sure that this is coming up on stream. It looks like it is. Excellent. Okay. Open insulin. This was started in California by some really, really keen people who realized that the price of insulin in America was a serious issue. Um, the price of insulin and all medicine in America continues to be a serious issue. The American market has its own unique problems. And in a lot of ways, the American market shares those problems with the rest of the world. It's not the fault of any individuals in America, it is simply institutions being institutions. But as a result of Americans uh, providing a, having a large purchasing power and being able to provide a large amount of market demand, it can be far more profitable for a lot of these companies, for these main three companies, to provide additional insulin to America or to other developed markets at the expense of providing a cheaper product to a larger global contingent. So whether or not this is a cause of a global oligopoly, that's up to you to decide. But these guys in California started it off, and that's Counterculture Labs in California, and around about the end of 2016, I called them up. It all started with Meow asking me to try and produce some DNA ligase for the lab. So I was researching protein synthesis. At this point, I was just an undergraduate with not much knowledge about biotech and still just trying to learn the ropes. Um, while researching protein synthesis and DIY protein synthesis, I came across Open Insulin and I called them up and said, hey, can I help? And they said, yes, we've run out of money. We'd love your help. And so I also, with no money, said that'll be great. And so I basically sat down and spent the next four to five months gathering papers and researching. Um, after that, let's have a... Uh, after that, I was lucky enough to be picked up by Nick Coleman at the University of Sydney because he needed a project for 2017 iGEM. I was currently at a different university. I went across to there and joined them and joined the team. And I want to really, really emphasize this, that the majority of the ideas and the work and the really clever engineering behind this doesn't come from me personally. It comes from Dr. Nicholas Coleman and the wonderful disco team that we put together that um, uh, had a whole bunch of skill sets. And so there were a full eight of us and we're still very close friends. Um, but, I, but after the end of the project, I then brought it back to here to the Biofoundry Lab to continue pushing the work. Um, and really the main thing I had to do when I brought it back to the Biofoundry Lab was upgrade the facilities here because a lot of the work that I'd done in Nick's lab was beyond what I currently could do here. It needed reagents and equipment and um, just a skill set that I didn't have. And so the next year of 2018 and going into 2019 has been me trying to upgrade this space learn everything that I can about the project and try and find a way to push it forward. Which, in some small ways I am, but in other ways I think that I could be doing a lot better. So, any questions? How much insulin can be produced when making it at home per day or say per month? That is entirely a question of the size of your bioreactor and the scale of your purification setup. So the, the systems that we use here are based upon the ones that are used in scientific papers that are then used in industry by the large companies. Um, so for an, ex for an example, one of the large companies has 50,000 litre reactors and it has 10,000 of them in a giant run. So th for me, what I would really like to do for the next stage of the project is try and exactly model how much scale of reactor you need for how much medicinal product. That then comes down as well to purification and purification efficiency, which, as I've said before, is definitely the big road hump that's sitting in front of me right now. Uh, Normal also asks, do you synthesize the A and B chains individually and later on join them to make insulin? 
Excellent question. You have been doing your reading. Um, so that's a, that's a chemical synthesis method that it avoids you having to worry about the formation of disulfide bonds between the A and B chains during the actual synthesis. You synthesize them separately, purify out the chains, and then try and stick them together in, an, uh, in a reductive environment. The workaround that we figure for that, we don't synthesize them separately, we synthesize them together, is to try and synthesize the insulin in the periplasm of the E. coli, which is, if you correct me if I'm wrong, a reductive environment. I do sometimes get this mixed up. I'll do some Googling if I'm wrong. Um, and so that, that environment is, the, the, the point being that the periplasmic environment is, uh, is good for the formation of disulfide bonds. And so you're more likely to get correctly folded products coming out the other end. Um, the, pro the protein that is expressed within the cytoplasm, that's more likely to form inclusion bodies, which is a whole bunch of incorrectly formed proteins that are forming a ball hiding its hydrophobic ends to the middle and pointing its hydrophilic stuff to the outside. And if you do it this way, which we, we also did with the cytoplasmic expression, you then have to have a chemical refolding step afterwards. So great question. Mm. I have the driest of mouths. Okay, so um, this market report by Axis, I would highly recommend um, ACC, IWS for anyone looking to try and understand the global market and challenges entering the global market, as well as sort of seeing what a single country scale manufacturer looks like. Because what Axis does really well is it sort of describes the foothold of the big three insulin manufacturers, as well as describing where insulin is provided that doesn't come directly from them. So I'm unsure of the specific stats for Nepal. I would be very interested to know how much a vial of insulin costs um, in Nepal and as well as if there is a differentiated pricing. Is there any sort of subsidized insulin price? Uh, and if not, how much does it cost at the chemist is something which I'm genuinely interested in because I don't have the resources to do this market research myself. I only have what Axis shows me. Um, but the, what they did find was that the, for the majority of people it was costing more than a week's wages and in some parts of the world it was costing more than a month's wages for a month's supply. Which is a very serious issue because you can't just be spending all of your money on insulin and or not have enough money even for a month's supply. You have to be spending them on the things that are required for living. Uh, food, shelter, water. So, uh, Disco. Disco was the wonderful name for our uh, iGEM team in 2017. There is a wiki with all of the details of things that you can might need, which I will post into the chat now. Um, so this wiki, I honestly, is smarter than I and has more knowledge than I could possibly impart to you within an hour. So I'll post that in that chat. And um, can I post in? Yeah, I can, I can broadcast it in, that, in Mobcast as well. Excellent. Uh, mob crush. So this wiki contains huge amounts of information, especially around, for example, what you might be most interested in is the protocol section, but um, uh, and the question about patents as well. You might be interested in looking at the patent law section as well, which might give you an idea of how to read a patent. So here you'll see all the different protocols set up ready for you to be able to um, synthesize your insulin, both protocols that we've done and then ones that we didn't get up to. So Things like the ELISA and the glucose uptake assay, as I'll talk about later, these were done by a third party lab and not by myself. And so these are things which I would very much like to do. Uh, okay. Just checking the various chats. Okay. Excellent. So back to the presentation. Uh, present. Right. So DISCO, designing insulin to be single chain and open source. The idea of a single chain insulin is one where the A and the B chains are joined together. So rather than them having two chains separate, uh, joined only by disulfide bonds, the C peptide, which normally runs from one end of the B chain around to the A chain, is actually an incorporated 12 amino acid linker. The idea behind this was to create an insulin that would still bind normally, but be more thermostable. Something which was, while a good idea because it would cut down on cold chain transportation, may have turned out to be ultimately unnecessary because as Medicine Sans Frontiers, aka MSF, aka Doctors Without Borders, have found insulin is actually nowhere near as uh, thermodegradable as we thought it is. So you can actually leave insulin in a uh, relative, like you can bury insulin underneath a tent um, or in the soil or even leave it just at the back of a tent for four to six weeks and you will still see it have 90 to 95% efficacy. 
That's not ideal because it does mean that it's going to be much harder for you to balance your blood glucose levels based upon an, a readout of a pump or a test strip, but it will at least mean that it isn't dangerous, and that's probably the most important thing, is that older insulins are not so much dangerous, they can just be a bit confusing in terms of the metabolic math involved. Cool. So these were the main three goals of what we were trying to do. Notice how actually manufacturing insulin for production is not there. Um, this is, this is partly from an acknowledgement that we're too small to make a difference and partly from an acknowledgement that by getting into the market it would create uh, undeniable conflicts of interest that would see us more wanting to make a short-term profit than bring the global price down. So we did make an active choice not to become manufacturers, instead to try and encourage other people to become manufacturers. And we'll check the comments again. And we're all good. So generate awareness. Simplify the process of insulin production. Once we get to fully mapping out the insulin production process, make it more efficient. That is definitely an, uh, a way in which we want to push things forward. Um, because with right previously the question of how much insulin can you make in a certain amount of time to uh, at home, it well it is a factor of the size of the reactor and the scale and speed of your purification. It's also a factor of the efficiency of your expression platform. So right now we use T7 expression. It's a slightly leaky platform, means that cells don't grow up to quite as high as OD600, uh, or don't grow as quickly to OD600 and aren't quite as effective when they get there. Um, it, uh, so a less leaky expression platform would be able to make things more efficient, um, as well as a platform that's able to express more insulin before it makes it lethal to the cell. And so maybe finding a way to make E. coli able to survive a longer expression time, E. coli with a larger periplasmic volume, so there's more space for... All of these are possible things that we could do to make it more efficient. Things that I have not done yet because I am still learning. So, uh, please understand. And we want to make it all open source. Everything we do, we want to make it available to everyone. And while there are some legal problems around transferring plasmids around um, from Australia, we're still very happy to do it and are working to make that as efficient as possible. Um, but you can also get a PET-15B plasmid and with a, a smallish synth synthesis budget of a couple of grand get all of these genes synthesized. So it's definitely a bigger budget than I have here. Without it being picked up by iGEM of Sydney, I'd probably still be sitting here talking about how I wish I had enough money to buy the actual gene. So it's very, very lucky for me to have been able to get that. Because it's, it's not just good enough to take some of my own DNA and PCR out the gene for the production of human insulin because that's code on optimized for human DNA. So if we want, to, we want to actually then express it into, into E. coli, we want to try and renegotiate the DNA, not to change the end amino acid that, um, that's, that's expressed, but to change the tRNAs that get us to there, because that's actually the limiting factor in protein expression and why we do code on optimization. It's not about uh, make it more efficient or the code's actually different. The code's the same, but the amount of tRNA is the different species produce for the expression of proteins varies. So that's why we actually had to buy the gene. All right. I'm just going to go undry out my mouth. Give me a sec. Keep my uh, wallet on me as well. through this presentation to the actual interesting science stuff, right? Okay, nice. So, there you go. There is your lovely uh, pro-insulin gene, which we, as I said before, we express as a whole. So we have the entire sequence for pro-insulin in there, C-chain included, and we also have an N-terminal his tag there, which isn't shown on the diagram, but that's what's necessary for purification. It's just six histidine molecules sitting on the end. I'm sure you've probably talked about it before in class. So we'll have a look at that when we get to the G-block. So... As mentioned before, in a normal insulin, uh, um, human insulin protein, the C chain is actually cleaved out before the protein becomes active. Uh, one thing, one, there's a problem with this diagram. It looks like that disulfide bond um, here has shifted upwards. That disulfide bond should be between the A and B chain. That's probably I, I probably made that mistake talking in Geneva. That's embarrassing. Okay, and so that's our active insulin. You can see the disulfide bonds now in the correct place. Cool. 
So we were curious about um, this. Does require cold chain transportation that does uh, increase the cost of things. Oh, um, you'll notice the structure of this presentation. It was made for. Is it already tested in humans? Absolutely not. No. So that's where I'm saying I need about ten million dollars to test it in humans. That's that's after I get a nice uh, clinically purified uh, sample. So human clinical trials don't cost a full ten million dollars. They cost somewhere in the order of two to three million, I think, for biosimilar. But then you also have a huge amount of additional costs on, that pile on top of that. So it is not tested in humans, I'm afraid. Um, if I'm lucky, it never will be, as I will talk about in with my hope that we will be able to find a way to share existing, already approved biosynthetic bacteria in a way that ties into patent law. Because you think about it, this was just made by me and some, and some friends and a, and a professor looking over us in the lab. And we are going to then try and put new human beings at risk because the... Uh, we can't get access to these other bacteria that produce the safe human insulin that we already have tested on humans, already put lives at risk doing. The idea of having to continuously repeat clinical trials for a danger that is already passed, you've already created the bacteria that produces it, I don't see any reason why that actual bacteria shouldn't be shared as well as the piece of paper that explains what's inside of it, because it's just too complex of a system to describe in words. Uh, to transport the plasma to the other country, is there any problem of quarantine? Yes! I have had some very interesting conversations with some friends in Europe talking about being able to transfer these overseas. Um, a lot of other countries other than Australia do not have nearly as tight quarantine laws and it is entirely country dependent. Australia has always historically been a country that loves heavy, heavy quarantine. If you've ever been to the Australian airport, you'll know that they will check your bags for everything and you have to fill out a form that it's, 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 as, it's as much as if there's any soil on your boots, you're probably going to have to uh, get those boots washed before you get into the country. So they do care in Australia a lot more about uh, importing things than exporting things. So I've talked to basically every regulatory body in Australia and they're all okay with me sending plasma DNA purified overseas. Now... Uh, let's talk about mouse because code on optimization again. I wouldn't be able to help you with mouse. I would be able to provide you with some good information, but we'll get to that in a sec. Um, so Australia, sending it out of Australia is not going to be too much of a problem. It all depends upon whether it's difficult importing it into your country, and I want to make sure that I tick all the boxes. I'm just a little bit uh, anxious about crossing lines here because this open source biotech thing is a relatively young science. I don't want to become a martyr to the cause. Um, so... As long as everyone's happy uh, in the government that wants to be happy, very, very happy to send things overseas, but trying to bring things into Australia, such as when I try to import Cas9 and CRISPR, which I did eventually do, can take multiple months and require lots and lots of official looking forms. So, ah, trying it in mice. So that's a interesting idea. Um, I've definitely also not cleared for any small mammal testing here. It, I, the, the funding required in Australia to do any kind of mice testing is very high. Can I just explain how a mouse test works for human insulin? And you'll tell me whether or not you want to do it. The main way which we test human insulin in mice does not involve the level of blood sugar that follows. What we do with mice is called... No, when I say we. No, what they've historically done with mice is called a mice seizure study. And the way that it works is you're effectively trying to... It's not quite an LD50 because I'm not sure it's lethal. You're just trying to find out the amount of insulin to pump into a mouse to make it have a seizure. Which... Uh, it's not great. So, honestly, not a big fan of the mouse seizure study as a way of testing things either. Um, if you save enough human lives after giving a few mice a seizure, I suppose I can give you a moral thumbs up, but... It's not something which I actively would like to do. What I think is very possible, and potentially possible on a smaller budget, if we can make these protocols open source, is in silica testing. So this is where you try and create a miniaturized organ on a chip for testing of things. And look, I'm not sure how technically difficult this would be with low cost resources. This is what I'm, I'd be trying to do. But if we could get, somehow get some mammalian cell culture growing between two plates, um, with a potential some kind of uh, vasculature going through there, we might be able to find a way to cheaply test human insulin without having to put any living organisms at risk. 
Um, that said, a mouse seizure study would be a lot lower cost. So if that was something which you were trying to do, it's probably also something which would be necessary before you get to human testing. So these are all reasons why using an already approved product that's already caused the necessary suffering to get it onto the market would be a, sufficient, a significantly better approach to go for rather than just doing it all again. Okay. Is the, if the creakiness of the chair is annoying you as well, let me know. Can we try it in chimps, says George Suzuki. Um, there are certain countries where primate testing is still the major way of testing things before getting into human models. Um, you can try it in chimps. Uh, we are so far away from getting any kind of ethical approval for that with our little lab here in Biofoundry, and it's not something which I particularly am interested as doing, in doing as an individual. You could make, if you could make a sufficiently good case to me for saving enough lives for chimp testing, you might be able to convince me, but them's some pretty sentient creatures you got going on there. And it would also be worth checking out to see whether um, uh, chimpanzee insulin is the same structure as human insulin. I don't actually know that, but if you were doing chimps, it wouldn't be some, for something like the mouse seizure study. It would be something more like uh, a human clinical trial where you're trying to figure out how much is required and whether or not it's getting the right uh, getting the right dosage in there and uh, whether or not it's causing any immune reaction as well is a big thing. So, cool. Sometimes all you need is a passion for what you do and $10 million. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. I agree. How is Biocon exactly reducing the cost to $0.10 cents per day for insulin? Is it something similar to open insulin? No. Biocon is just selling at cost price with a little bit of government subsidy. But Biocon and Wachart, they are selling just close to their manufacturing cost. So I think it's worth emphasizing. The cost of insulin should be where Biocon and Wachart are at. Um, and I do not believe there is anything novel in Biocon's expression platform. That said, they may be keeping it as a trade secret rather than as patent. But nonetheless, it does appear that Biocon and Wachart, using the same technology, the same resources, are just able to actually sell it at a reasonable price, unlike the big three that shall not be named. Um, so there, um, there, there is the, the, the fact that the Indian government, um, at least as of 2017, was about 300% over budget in its allocation of funds for the subsidization of insulin manufacture or at least the, the checkout subsidies. I'm not sure whether that was manufacturing or, or, or checkout subsidy. And so, you know, there, it, it might be slightly higher. It might be... When, I, when, when I'm asked to quote where a, a vial of insulin should be on the global market, my answer is always around about 2 to $3 a vial. And that sort of matches in where Biocon's added about $0.10 cents per vial. So I'm not certain how much profit they're making on that. They may be only lose, making a little bit. And one concerning outcome that should be considered by us, um, and you know we don't want to uh, we don't want to make excuses for the big insulin manufacturers, but we should understand them as motivated by profit. And if we do cause the actual price of insulin to crash down to where Biocon and Wachart are providing, the question is whether or not they will make the um, rational, econo uh, economically rational decision to move out of the market into a more profitable product, which would itself further constrain the supply. So, um, while I really want to in induce a price war in the market, the fear is that inducing the price war too fast without providing time for generic manufacturers to enter the market could actually cause a short-term supply constraint unless government bodies step in to force these companies to remain in the market, which Pick your political opinion on that. Cool. Keep asking questions. I'll keep going with the, with the production. Cool. So this is um, this is the patented version of single chain insulin, aka Psi fifty. Oh, sorry. We looked at patented insulins, Psi fifty seven specifically. Uh, the legal department of the University of Sydney said no, we can't use Psi fifty seven. So we threw all that wor work out, and I'm not allowed to mention it. I didn't mention it just then. Uh, we then went back to the drawing board. One of our students in the iGEM team was a combination law and science person. So she studied all the patents and found a loophole for a six amino acid linker that didn't have a couple of other things in it. And so it was her design that ultimately became Winsulin. 
So that was the patented version was thrown out. The loophole was a single chain insulin with a linker of 5 to 11 amino acids and does not contain two adjacent basic amino acids. So that was our loophole. That was our design constraint, and that was ended up being the actual design of Winslin. So we were quite happy with that. So that's what the linker region looks like. All of this is available online on the iGEM wiki that I linked you. I also have plasmid files available here on this computer that we can have a little geese at later. Um, but yeah. Also, just how are we doing for time? We should be finishing at 2.30. So I still got another half an hour and a bit. Good. Okay, I'm not going too slowly. So that's what the linker looks like. Um, I believe that my friend was playing the game fold.it or fold it um, for while she was designing this. It helped her uh, think in space well enough to design this, which ended up being functional and uh, binding in the way that we expected it to. So if you enjoy playing games and you want to learn at the same time, je definitely check out fold it uh, or Eterna is a good RNA folding game that I love. So. Um, and then we also finished with a single dibasic residue there, which I believe was still didn't actually, uh, it, yeah, caused it to be more protease resistant to stop it being cut there because this, um, this arginine here, uh, tends to be cut, um, in the original design of insulin. It's cut by trypsin. Thank you. I didn't look over at the poster just then to remember it was up here. I promise. <laughs> Uh, and we also subbed out a asparagine for a glycine there at the end of the A chain, which is something which has been found to actually make insulin a better molecule, or a more effective molecule. Uh, it's definitely one which is a pretty regular motif in other uh, insulin analogues. Uh, it also... Now, I'm not very good at understanding um, PIs in terms of pharmacokinetics, but it did, we think, push it to be a more fast-acting insulin. But that is definitely something which needs to be further looked at. So this is something which the World Health Organization has said. As I said, I've had anecdotal evidence that suggests otherwise. A lot of diabetics will tell me that they prefer to go for the long acting and the short acting, which um, if you have a pump as well, it can be a lot easier to go like that. Um, that said, if you're going to die because you don't have insulin, you don't really care what analog you're getting, you just need something to inject yourself with. And so what matters more is a wider spread of supply than newer, fancier, smarter, better insulins. But as a result of innovation in the marketplace, we end up seeing a lot less generics because the entrance of new generic manufacturer to the market is constrained by the gatekeepers I was talking about earlier. Cool. Do insulin analogues provide little or no advantage? Just a quick note. When I was at the Geneva Health Forum, I was very, very sort of uh, overawed by everyone that was there, and I understood that my knowledge definitely did not com compare or rate with theirs. So I said, uh, don't ask me questions, I'm going to ask you questions. So these question slides here are actually me asking the crowd, because I wanted to know if anyone in the crowd objected to any of these questions or had thoughts about them. Uh, and the general thought is that other than perhaps a small quality of life boost, no, analogues do not provide any advantage. And if you are trying to provide low cost to a uh, regional market, you should definitely go for regular human insulin. Don't go for Winsulin. Winsulin is a fun uh, design practice experiment, but you're definitely going to need a full stage one through four clinical trial before you try and enter the market with Winsulin. So definitely look at the human insulin stuff and play with Winsulin if you want to have some fun. Cool. Expression systems. Hooray. This is the fun part. So these are the three expression platforms that we used. And as I mentioned before, the Bacillus subtle strain was owned by the University of Sydney. It's a special knockout strain. And so I don't have it anymore. I still have the genes and I still have the plasmids and though they're not together, so I'll have to cut them together if you do want them. Um, but the difference of the Bacillus subtle system was twofold. It, it not only integrated the gene into the actual genome, it also sent the expressed protein out of the cell for uh, to be exported to the rest of the cell. Sorry, to the, to the extracellular media. Rather than staying in the center of the cell in the cytoplasm or in the edge of the cell in the periplasm, this left the cell entirely, which should be more efficient for a continuous stirred tank reactor type system, one that's continuously providing more food to the bacteria. 
uh, because the cells don't actually need to die in order to be able to then be harvested. They can just continuously keep eating and keep pumping out insulin. So, um, and that is also a system which has, is expired intellectual property. However, as I mentioned before, the specific strain of Bacillus subtilis that we used was owned by the University of Sydney. That doesn't mean that there aren't um, expired IP B subtilis strains out there. It just means that I don't have it at the moment, I'm afraid. So you can definitely get that one working again. And in my opinion, I think it has the most economic potential is the human insulin secretory expression. That said, the, probably the lowest cost to purify out of the three is the periplasmic one because you can actually just dissolve the periplasm without killing, without breaking open the rest of the cell. Definitely kills the cell, sorry. Without breaking open the rest of the cell, you can use a chloroform extraction method that just dissolves the periplasm but leaves the rest of the cell intact, which makes the next stage of purification significantly easier because you're not dealing with cellular components falling all over each other and proteases and having to... It, it, it's just a lot simpler of a method. So, what does cytoplasmic expression look like? It's a PEP15B plasmid. Um, this one is a very bread and butter plasmid. It's used all over the world. It's got the LAC-Z operon, and so it's basically hacking into the lactose expression of bacteria. <coughs> and rather than using lactose, we use a lactose-like molecule, IPTG, to induce uh, production of the protein. Because if we provide lactose, it just eats the lactose and then goes back to life as usual. IPTG, it can't break down, but it still turns on all the systems for lactose because it mistakes the molecule. So the big thing about the cytoplasmic expression system, it can probably produce more raw protein, but the protein is going to be in these wrapped up inclusion bodies that aren't actually functional. They have to be then chemically refolded, which itself can be an extremely expensive and arduous process. I've seen, uh, it's, it seems to be a many, many step reaction to get it back there. And so, the ultimate would be to provide properly folded protein for to that, that can then immediately just be purified on a column and then made into a medicinal purity vial to be sent to someone. So rather than then having to go through multiple chemical purification steps and then having to get rid of all those chemicals out of there, you're mostly just worried about cellular components when you're looking at the periplasmic expression system. So we have to lyse the entire cell and yeah, have to then do chemical refolding, which is expensive. Okay. Oh good, so we've got some G-blocks here. So, um, I'm not sure if anyone has been involved with iGEM previously or looked at iGEM's design constraints and system. Um, then Constraints is not the right word. It's more of a, it's just a platform. So, until recently you actually had to send in all of your genes inside a PSB1C3 plasmid to America where they would then keep them in a whole bank. Now it's entirely kept as data because we know that, you know, DNA is just data, and so it's just as easily stored as zeros as ones as it is as stored in, as wetware, and it's honestly more reliable for long-term storage. So, we were still looking at the uh, having to send in the PSB1C3 plasmid. So you'll see the biobrick prefix and suffix here. Those are a standard insert um, cut and paste restriction enzyme. They've each got three sites on either side, and it lets you stick into a number of different plasmids without any without much trouble finding the right multi-cloning site to do so. So this suffix and prefix makes it really easy to stick into a few different plasmids, namely PSB1C3 and PET15B, right at the spot that you want them. We also have a ribosome binding site necessary for any kind of uh, protein synthesis. We have the ecotin tag. So this is actually, if you, if you ignore this ecotin tag, this is just the gene for the cytoplasmic expression. With the ecotin tag in there, it actually then commands the cell to send the, the in, uh, in process of being constructed protein out to the periplasm of the cell. Ecotin is actually bigger than insulin, so it's, it's less efficient in that way because it's actually having to produce more protein, like more than twice the amount of protein per insulin molecule. And the periplasm is also limited in space. It's only a certain, got a certain volume and so it's more likely to kill the cell quicker. That said, with that ecotin tag, the paper that this was taken from was able to create completely correctly folded insulin because of the native state of the periplasm. So that was why we chose this uh, and why I believe that this would probably be your easiest in terms of producing an already folded molecule. Cool. So that's, that's what it looks like there. And we can actually lyse just the outer membrane by using chloroform. Okay, let's have a look at the chats. 
Okay. What are the present experimental problems in the project related to plasmid stability, expression rate, toxicity to E. coli? Haven't run into many problems there. We are able to build them up to the correct OD600, induce production, grow them overnight, lyse the cells, and then run them on an SDS page. For me, the main experimental problems then come with actually getting the funding to do the next stage of the purification. So... Honestly, the things like plasmid stability, as long as you're continuously keeping the, the media updated with antibiotics, you're not going to have any problem with the bacteria spitting out the plasmid. Expression rates of T7 expression system is very, very well described in the literature. That said, I would not write off the possibility of there being some kind of ligation error or mistake in our design that means that we're not quite getting the full efficiency of the T7 expression system. Um, but it's pretty safe to assume, considering that we've got the, um, uh, the sequencing results, that everything's spaced correctly along uh, from each other, the ribosome binding site's close enough, um, the his tag is working, that there isn't really any problem with expression rate. Toxicity to E. coli is definitely a, a major design factor and constraint. Um, What's interesting, and I'll talk about it in a little while, that there is, an, there is one more plasmid that I haven't talked about, which is a new open source plasmid made by the University of Sydney. It's called uh, PUS, Plasmid University of Sydney, P-U-S uh, uh, 24X, PUS 24X. And I've just recently gotten this one and I've ligated my insulin gene into there. I haven't done any testing on it and I haven't even managed to get enough funding to get it sequenced, but I have found that, well, what I've been told about this plasmid is a number of things. Not only is it open source straight from the start, it has a much, much less leaky expression system using a cumate operon, which can use cumate or cumin to induce. And it is a broad host range expression platform, meaning that it can actually work in a whole bunch of different bacteria. So it might be interesting and fun to sort of experiment with some other, looking at this in bacillus maybe, looking at this in some other bacteria, potentially looking at trying to um, cut some of my other genes in there. Currently only the cytoplasmic proinsulin is in there, but that might be something which I can work on to reduce potential toxicity to E. coli. That said, the both the uh, periplasmic and the cytoplasmic expression platforms do ultimately result in, in toxicity death for the bacteria. It's really about how much well-folded protein can you get before reaching that stage. That's the ultimate question. BSK, hello. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please feel free to ask any questions. I believe we still have about 20 minutes left, but uh, let me know if I've got that wrong. I, I can't remember how long we, we decided to go for. Um, so yeah, reduced proteases and isomerases in the periplasmic space, as well as having the correct... Um, uh, I'm not going to try and explain this. This maths is completely beyond me, but this was an attempt by one of my teammates to describe the actual efficiency of the production system. If you look on the iGEM wiki, you can dive a bit further into the maths and judge whether or not it's actually good or bad maths, but it is a it, it does describe a way in which you can try and estimate uh, how much protein you can create before you get resulted cell death. To be honest, it's so far beyond my understanding that I'm not going to pretend to explain it to you. So um, uh, it was done by my friend Ruby. If you, any problems, direct your questions to Ruby. Um, but this should tell us here roughly the amount of folded and unfolded protein produced by each model. So as you can see, we end up with a whole bunch more folded protein in the periplasmic expression system than in the cytoplasmic expression system. But in terms of overall protein yield, we would still get more yield from cytoplasmic expression. So, this is the fun system that actually exports the protein to the surrounding media. Um, I haven't gotten to play around with this one in my lab. As said before, I don't have the Bacillus subtilis strain. But when I was originally doing the design for this project and talking, this was what I really sort of envisioned, was using a continuous stirred tank reactor that's feeding food in one end and collecting uh, media out the other end and dead cells, but not actually interfering with the live cells that are currently incubating. So you're constantly keeping yourself at the maximum uh, exponential growth rate at the same time as getting all of the yield out of there. The, idea, the hopeful idea of that is that you can get a much longer lasting system that continuously produces insulin. And if we were to think about the bathtub insulin idea that we originally talked about, the make insulin at home idea, 
this sort of system would probably be your best for a smaller scale system because you wouldn't have to continuously be changing out the tanks. So um, I haven't gotten to play around with this one, but the YNCM tag is the tag that tells it to export it to the um, uh, to the outside of the cell. And the actual plasmid that's not shown here, because it's just got the prefixes and the suffixes, was an integrative plasmid. So it wasn't the PET15B plasmid. Um, yeah, I, I, I might have the name of the plasmid later. I, I, it's definitely on the, on the wiki though. Um, so this is the WB800 strain that we had to uh, ditch. It's an 8 protease knockout strain. There are other Bacillus subtler strains out there, some of which are open source, some of which are intellectual property expired. Have a hunt down for those, and you would be able to use our design in them. Um, WB800 is not available on the market. Cool. So right now we have two different molecules, proinsulin, winsulin. We have three different expression systems, of which one is knocked out. So we have a total of four insulin-producing bacteria, uh, four individual insulin-producing bacterial strains. I also have four copies of each, just in case there is a ligation error or a some kind of error that's, that's occurred that was not expected uh, as backups just in case we get further down the line and we need to go back to first principles or, or back to earlier in the experiment. Um, if however it turns out that one of these systems doesn't work and it is actually what the sequence is believed to be then we have to go back all the way to the start and try and redesign from scratch but so far it seems to be functioning. So purification! This is absolutely where I'm up to. So I uh, I'm looking to try and work on low-cost protocols. I've now got some wonderfully skilled people coming into my lab who are machinists and engineers who might be able to help me work on a DIY HPLC. At the moment, I mostly hunt around the loading docks of universities where they throw out beautiful, really functioning equipment here in Australia because we're overly blessed and hoping that someone throws out a piece of equipment that, that I can be used for this uh, purification process. But right now, what purification looks like to me is I have some cotton wool, some nickel agarose beads inside a plastic uh, syringe, and I squeeze the, the cell lysate through the syringe, through the nickel agarose, and then I squeeze imidazole in varying concentrations through until I can wash off my protein. So definitely not pure enough for humans. I would like to emphasize that. Not even pure enough to give a mouse a seizure. Um, as you will note from all of our designs, there is the hist tag in there. These are six histidine molecules. It's basically, you could think of it as a little magnetic end. Um, and so what that does is as it passes through the nickel agarose, this gets bound to the nickel agarose while everything else gets washed off. Let's talk about that. Would love to get me some pus. Open MTA. Also, video is cutting out some of the slides bottom right corner. Ah, yes, of course. Sorry about that. That's probably a little bit confusing. I, at this point, I think I'm just going to leave it. So, um, if Andrew Gray says he would love some pus, I can hook you up with Nicholas Coleman and his student Mark Creedeman who made it. He should be able to get it to you. Uh, Mark Creedeman is also the guy who recently created an open source green fluorescent protein that is brighter than superfolder green fluorescent protein, my currently brightest green fluorescent, fluorescent protein. So, uh, yes, definitely get in contact with Nick Coleman. If you want, I can hook you up with him. Um, continuing, if anyone in Nepal has any more questions, please keep posting them. Uh, I think we've still got... I'll keep speeding through because we're starting to run closer on time. So... With the regular human insulin, if we go back here, you can look at the design. The design is such that when we do the enzymatic cleavage to either cut at this arginine or TEV protease site, the molecule as a whole should fall off. Uh, note that the suffix isn't expressed. The suffix is at the after the uh, stop codon. So when we cut the his tag at the cleavage site, the hope is that you will end up with a whole protein that doesn't have any dangly bits off the end, which was a big thing we needed to consider. This is what that kind of looks like on a molecular scale. Um, I'm keeping in mind here that this may not be... Uh, look, I'm sorry about the webcam cutting things off. Uh, I'm, I'm worried that if I swap across, uh, that it's going to cause a problem. Geez, booze. Uh, Benj asks if pus 24 x is a pus 250 derivative. I believe it is. Or it's one that sort of came up while working to try and make pus 250. But it's definitely... It definitely has pus 248 in its history, and I think that 249 was a failure. And then I think, in fact, even this might have been the first pus 250 
But hit the iPhone X, you know, that kind of joke. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm going to keep presenting here. I'm sorry about the bottom left, hand, bottom right hand corner. My concern is that if I move the webcam right now, it's going to cause more audio problems and I'll save by explaining things. So, question number three for the crowd at Geneva, which is going to be most important to us, to you and to all of us, is... Is there another scaling cost that contributes more to the final price of insulin than nickel agarose? Right now, as far as I can tell, once you've got the insulin producing bacteria and the, the actual facilities to grow it and purify it, there are almost no scaling costs. You just need peptone and yeast extract and water to feed to them. Um, the only real scaling cost comes in, or the actual consumable comes with the nickel agarose beads. So, Two, two, there's two potential answers here. One is find a more efficient way to make nickel agarose beads or find a different way of purifying things. This might be a different way of using the his tag with a cheaper reagent for purification or this might be ditching the his tag entirely and trying some other way of expressing a purification motif. I do recall starting up a channel to discuss this that I promptly forgot about and didn't check in with. Um, it's a very, very complicated problem, and it's probably more likely that we would want to look for something which is coming off uh, an expired patent than trying to do the research ourselves. That said, if there was some wonderful person out there who was able to create a protein purification platform that didn't use nickel agarose, that they then made open source, you can bet that we'll be jumping on that really, really quickly. So, right now, if I had to guess why Biocon and Wachart had to sell their insulin for 10 cents a day rather than for 2 cents a day, I would blame Nicol Agros. So keep an eye out. Maybe you can find a paper out there that I never found that describes a better process. Maybe you yourself are working on a process that could do this better. But as far as I can tell, there isn't a scaling cost that contributes more to the final price than Nicol Agros. So blame that. That's what it looks like. Generally, you can do a kind of quick and dirty purification using a centrifuge or, as I said, just by using the plunger on a syringe. I would be very, very reticent to put that in any living organism. So please do not do that, or, uh, or at least I would recommend that you do not. Um, look for a better way of purifying. Look for... A, it, it's definitely possible to do histag purification with an HPLC and get good enough purification for human consumption, but these quick and dirty purifications, they're still going to leave antigens and pieces of cell wall and various proteins that are likely to cause an immune response, if not a catastrophic one. So be very, very careful. Okay, on to the parts that I didn't design. Any questions? Are we running out of time, Sundashan? So we then sent this off to an external lab because we'd run out of time and run out of funding. They did an ELISA assay and they found that we were able to bind anti-insulin antibodies so we were producing a correctly folded product we did a glucose uptake assay and well they did a glucose uptake assay they were able to show that it did end up taking up more the cells involved ended up taking up more glucose i would love to reproduce these myself but i do not have the funding so keep in mind that i didn't do these these are not my results but they are all available on the wiki these are our estimates of startup costs in a uh, in a market similar to Australia, America, or Europe, um, you would definitely be able to get lower costs than these in Southeast Asia, potentially in Nepal. Uh, that said, the, it's worth thinking about um, good manufacturing practice expenses. Generally, whatever you think you would require to just build the actual manufacturing plant, add 40% of that cost for GMP compliance initially. And then whatever you think it would cost to run the plant, add another 40% of running costs for GMP compliance as you go along. So if you want to make something which is safe for people to consume, you should absolutely follow GMP rules. Um, that's not going to get you all of the way. It's still very important to have a functioning purification process, but GMP is very important. We have not more than five minutes. Okay, well, rounding up, what's next? Send it around the world, do some testing, buy an HPLC, get more money, thank everyone who's on here, all these attributions, without any of these people, I would still be sitting here wondering what on earth I could do. Um, this doesn't actually have the names of the of the disco team, so I would like to thank them as well. Um, without them, I couldn't have done it. You can find pictures and thanks to all of them on the, um, on the website. 
uh, team about us. So I'll just bring up their photos as well as a quick thank you to all of these lovely human beings. If you uh, notice any problems with the maths, direct your problems to Ruby. Any problems with the law, direct your problems to Steph. Um, and uh, yeah, a really, really big thanks to everyone involved here. Um, because, you know, I'm just one man and I really am not in any way the whole story. Um, I'd also like to point out that in America they're doing some wonderful work as well. You should check in with those guys and, and, and see whether you could do a chat with them as well. Um, but I will reiterate the fact that the American market is its own problem. And the American market causes problems for other people as well. It's not their fault, but when you can make a much bigger buck in another market, there is no reason to go and sell to Nepal. And so, um, in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, it is incumbent on people in their own countries to be able to solve this problem. But the ultimate would be if we can set up someone with a great competitive advantage to produce things cheaply, uh, and and to be able to provide to local markets. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. I really appreciate it. I'm, I, I, if, you, if you're ever in Sydney, our lab is open to the public and you're welcome to come visit. If I'm ever lucky enough to come visit Nepal, I will absolutely try and drop by Media Lab. And no, I, I just, I really appreciate this, offer, this opportunity to share my work with you. Finally, if you would like to work out some kind of plasmid transfer, message the Facebook page or get Sundashan to message me and we will try and figure that out. It will require some box ticking of boxes. We don't want to get in trouble for doing this. And when I do give you the plasma transfer, we'll have to talk about a minimum required level of progress before you go and do any human testing. Because while I trust the work of my colleagues, I'm terribly afraid of my work causing harm to some person. And so that's my fear. Thank you, everyone. Long live the nation of the internet and long live open source science. I really love the opportunity to get to speak internationally. And so thank you so much. I will talk to you later.